Hey everybody, this is David Delaney with the Sales Development Podcast. I want to thank you for tuning in. If you're new to the show or new to this series, we're doing a four-part series going from being in the corporate world to becoming an entrepreneur. And we call it the Freedom Fighter Series. It's a little bit different than how we usually do it, where we talk to sales development leaders and, and professionals to get their strategies and tips. But super relevant to anybody in the sales development world because at the end of the day, we're in charge of our own destiny here and we are sort of entrepreneurs within the companies where we work. So I really hope that you enjoy this and we'll do four of these and then we'll go back to our regularly scheduled programming of talking to leaders in the sales development space and reps in the sales development space. Thank you so much. Please do leave a comment and let us know if you like this series, if you want more, if you want to talk to more entrepreneurs, and if you don't like it, we we want to hear that as well. Thanks again, and we'll talk soon. Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Sales Development Podcast. David Delaney here, your host, and I am joined by Garrett Merguth. Sorry, man. <laughs> oh, that was good. That was pretty close. That was like pretty good. That was, yeah, no, no, no. As that, was, that was on point. Okay, I've been starting out good. And Garrett's the co-founder and CEO of Directive. Garrett, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure, dude. Just glad to be here chatting with you and your audience. And yeah, no, this is a this is an awesome time for sure. This is awesome because, like, we were talking a little bit before the show. We're mainly focused on sales development and chatting about the the whole world and the intersections between sales and marketing and and how you think about that. So I'm really curious to dive into that. And also just the fact that, hey, you, over the course of the last five years, you and your co-founders have taken Directive from a bootstrapped, you know, scrappy company to now growing, expanding, and you know, that process. I mean, you're still alive. You're still here with us. So yeah. I want to dig into that too, you know, just from an entrepreneurial perspective. So I'm excited to dive in. Garrett, if folks are not familiar with you, your background, directive, give us some background to set the context. Yeah, I was a young, ambitious MBA grad, kind of, you know, did my degree in three years, did my master's in a year. Bushy eyed, want to take over the world, applied to Boston, Bain, McKinsey, Deloitte. And they clearly articulated to me that I was not going to take over the world their way. I got auto responses essentially saying, you know, we're not interested. And I said, you know, in my brain, okay, well, I can build my own consulting firm. One day you'll probably just have to buy me. And so that was kind of my mentality. I didn't know what I was going to consult on because I didn't know anything. So I kind of looked around and figured out how did people with financial purchasing power perceive me? And they perceived me as someone who could help them with the internet, figuring out how to position their businesses online, how to get leads from the internet, how to make their phone ring. And things like that. So I decided I should learn that. And so I went through kind of a lot of the different parts of digital marketing and I landed on SEO and PPC and content being the things that I could drive the most revenue with. And if I could drive the most revenue with, I could charge the most for. So I decided I was going to get good at those. And that was about it. So I was driving my moped around, handing out flyers, got some guy with a Mediterranean shop to hire me. I didn't do really any SEO or PPC for him. I just made him a Yelp page, a Facebook page handed out flyers at the university and other places to try to get some foot traffic. Did that for about 30 days, came back on the 30th day and the whole place was boarded up. And yeah, that was my very first ever client. So, you know, never got paid, learned a lot. And that was the start of directive. So, you know, it always, it's never quite as grand or as spectacular as you might hope, but yeah, that's how I got started. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. This is hilarious. I mean, not, not funny, but uh, you know, just, no, that's how it, yeah, before that I was doing Fiverr. So I was selling $5 social media calendars and <laughs> yeah, man, just hustling, trying amazing. to figure it out. That is amazing. So, so this is, this is just so much here. I mean, first of all, you had everything from a standardized perspective, like everything was going for you. You had the, the education, you had the pedigree, like you were going in, you go, your plan is to go to these big consulting firms and just crush it, flying all over the world, consulting with these huge companies and you get rejected and you're just like, okay, now instead of just like getting crushed and being all bummed out, I mean, I'm sure that you were, but you took that and said, how do people perceive me and the value that I bring? And that's really interesting. So like, tell me more about that. So 
like what you're saying is when people looked at you and, and thought about what you could do for them, it, it kept coming back to the internet and, and, you know, marketing. Like, well, who wants to listen to a 22 year old kid tell them about management consulting? <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. So you, you, you can dream all you want, but nobody pays you for your dreams. Right. And so you got to kind of figure out where you can at, where first they perceive it's just a lot easier to get started in anything to align perception and passion. So I have kind of like a value system around, you know, perception is reality. And, you know, you see it in sales reps all the time. They don't dress right. They show up late. They don't take notes. They give generic proposals. They, they do everything for scale and then wonder why they don't have the close rate they dream of. And so, you know, for me, it was always take my passion, which was, you know, helping businesses and trying to get better. And then, I just like to get better at things. So whatever it is, I, I don't mind being bad. I think, you know, for me, the thing that's helped me a lot over the years is the process of getting good for me is the most fun part. And so, you know, I just decided, okay, I'm going to become the best at this, not just good at it or not just make some money at it. I never really intended to do it for the money. It was, could I become the best in the world at my craft? And if you're the best at something, you can charge the most, which means you have the best gross profit, which means you can fund your growth, which means you can hire top talent. And then you can build essentially the most revenue. And so, you know, that's kind of the route I took and just said, okay, people think that I know the internet or that I know more than them because I'm younger than them. I didn't, but I could. And so I just went out and read every blog that had been written on SEO that I could get my hands on. And I created a little motto called learn, engage, create. So if I could learn something new every day and engage with it, I could create more value for myself and the customer. And I just been doing that every day for about five years straight. And you do all right if you do that. I like that model, learn, engage, create. And so you looked at it and you said, okay, so this is how I'm perceived. And I can't, you know, right now I need to learn, engage, and create so that I can, I can live up to that. And at the same time, this is how I can start to bring in some revenue so I can actually run the company. Yeah. And, and so you really focused on SEO and PPC at the beginning. Yeah, it was mostly just SEO actually at first. So I was just doing SEO and then I brought in someone to run the PPC department and grow that with me. And, you know, I slowly built it, you know, well, not maybe necessarily slowly, but, you know, just kind of built it from there. And just figured it out. Okay. And then you mentioned something really interesting. You don't mind being bad at the beginning. So it's like, I think a lot of people are really hung up on that because it's like, as you come through school and, you know, everything is about like getting an A and doing everything right, not making mistakes, like all that stuff. And I think people's ego gets really wrapped up in like, I can't look stupid. Like, I don't want to look stupid or I don't want to look like I don't know what I'm doing. But you're just like, hey, I don't mind being bad because at that same time, you're going to be improving yourself, right? Well, yeah, for me, like, you understand, like, nothing was ever given to me. I don't come from like means, you know, like I, I got a scholarship for college for soccer. But when I first started soccer, I was terrible, like terrible. I went to play club. I was on the worst club team in the area and I got cut. And so I figured out who the best coach was, built a relationship with him, helped him out with anything he needed, washing his car, doing all that. And I just trained with him as much as I could every week. And then I trained on my own every day. And then I eventually was on the number one team in the country two years later. My point here is everyone who's listening and everyone out there can be incredibly successful at whatever they set their mind to. They just need to be consistent. The barrier to success is so stinking low, it should scare you. If you can be consistent, understand how people work and can play the game to a certain extent, and then really focus on developing your skill sets. But like, if we all just read 15 minutes a day, you'd read 15 more minutes than everyone else. You know, like it, it, it's really not <laughs> That's amazing. that high. Like, you know, I decided I want to be good at golf. I was shooting 120 and I just shot a 78 and it took nine months. And all I did was practice every day for like 30 minutes. And my point here is like anything you do on a consistent basis and you're passionate about, you can become really, really good at. You might not be able to become the best in the world at it unless you fully commit to it, but you can become really good at things if you just decide that you're going to give it time, attention, and appreciation. That's so true. And so, you know, you mentioned something about the, the, the sales reps that you see out there. They're almost like going through the motions, you know, and you said they're doing everything for scale. But it's like they're not seeing the results of that. And so how do you get out of that like default zombie? It's entitlement. Yeah, it's entitlement, yeah. David. Like we, we, we think that we deserve to close deals and we don't. Okay. We're entitled. And we don't, we don't actually realize it, like myself included. But when you start to look at the way we prepare and the way we honor the other person's time, 
we don't necessarily fully honor them and then wonder why we don't fully close them. We worry more about closing the deal than helping them. And so we alienate ourselves, right? And so if you can like marry trust plus expertise, and that's the biggest thing, right? The problem is most reps, they go into a firm or an agency or a product market or an industry, whatever they're in, and they don't decide that they're going to become subject matter experts. They just want to go out there. They want to close deals. They want to do, they want to go do sales. And the problem is, is you never become elite at sales and you're never going to close the average order values and the types of contracts that are really going to make you frankly wealthy in sales. If you aren't a subject matter expert, you just can't compete at the next level. And I see the biggest constraint I see in sales reps, myself internally here at Directive and and everywhere I look is they aren't committed to becoming subject matter experts in the thing they're selling. I don't mean like just better than the client. I mean like actually subject matter experts. And because they don't do that, they lose. And it sinks, you know, it's sad. Okay, so so basically, you know, if, if I think about it, like people, they become a sales rep, they drop into a company for two or three years, they learn like just enough about the product, do demos, like move on, and then all of a sudden they're gone, right? And then they're going to another company for two, two years or so. What you're saying is like really dig into the actual industry that you're serving and the people you know, and become a subject matter expert and stick around and like go deep on it instead of the very surface level, right? Well, yeah. I mean, at a very young age, you know, we were able to close very large enterprise deals. And I was able to do that not because they wanted to grab a drink with me, not because they liked me necessarily, but because I prepared more and I was sharper and I had deeper subject matter expertise than anyone else they were talking with. So they trusted me the most. And my, my point here is like a lot of people are selling enterprise software, but they're not software engineers and they don't see the value in taking a code class and putting 15 grand of their own money to actually learn JavaScript or C++ or SQL. So when they go talk to a CTO, they don't sound like a jackass and they don't even realize they sound like one because they don't value what the CTO does. And then they wonder why they lose the deal to the founder sales guy who's an engineer been doing it for 20 years and he talks that CTO's language and they wonder why they lost it. And that's kind of my point is like, if you want to be able to perform at an elite level in sales, you truly do need to be a subject matter expert if you want to close enterprise type deals in a consistent way and have a competitive advantage other than the product you're selling. You don't have an intrinsic competitive advantage as the rep if you aren't a subject matter expert. You're completely codependent on the product you're selling and that's never a healthy place to be as in sales. Yes. And, and that's probably why you see so much turnover in the position. And so let's bring it back to how, how can somebody, like somebody b- listens to this, they buy in, they're like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to double down. I'm not going to be a sleepwalking zombie through my sales career. Like, and then bring it back, consistency. So how does somebody become a subject matter expert in their industry? Well, they have to decide that they're passionate about it. You're not going to become a subject matter expert if you don't have passion. And so if you're selling a product or service you're not passionate about, you got to stop, change career paths, find something that you actually care about because you're not going to be motivated enough to become a subject matter expert because nobody pays you to become a subject matter expert. You get paid three years from now. So it's a long-term play and the passion won't be there and you'll go back to your old habits of just trying to close deals and hit your numbers so you get to your quotas and then you go from there. And you wonder why, by the way, also you can't move vertically because you don't understand the industry fully. So nobody's going to make you a director of sales if you don't know every player in the space, competitive advantages of your product, other products, and what the next step is. So you don't move vertically, so you keep hopping horizontally, and then you get burnt out, and you eventually never grow. And so you have to find the thing you're passionate about and then decide to become the expert at it. And then that's when you you know, you know become truly, truly successful in, in your field. Okay, and if somebody's sit, sitting here going... Okay, man, I'm selling like like widgets, you know, or some like some some connector thing that connects like two boxes together, and like I I don't know if I feel passionate about this. Is your should they start to look around and really try to dig into themselves and find that passion? Well, yeah, because you have to go introspective first. You have to, right? Right. The way I've always started is what am I like? I take how people perceive me, the natural gifts I've had, and the things I'm passionate about. And you put those all together and now you're a dynamic salesperson or dynamic executive or dynamic anything. So if you're selling widgets and you're not passionate about those widgets, how are you supposed to bring the right energy to the table that differentiates you from the two other pitches they got? You just, you can't, it's not authentic. 
So you have to be authentically passionate about what you're selling if you really want to get an above industry average close rate and you want to be a top performer. And so you have to find that passion or else you're just not going to close the same deals. I'll, I'll tell you right now, if I'm competing against you, I'll win because I would die for my ideas. I would die for what I'm selling because I love it that much and I'm that passionate about it. And the person who's buying, that's what they want to hire over anything. And that right there is why you can be successful in sales. And if you aren't willing, if you don't feel that way, there's someone out there who does and that's why you lose sometimes. Wow. Okay. And so I see this all the time in people, you know, who are struggling because, you know, you get out of school and you might have student loan debt and, you know, you got to pay your bills and you got to do all these things, go to Coachella and like, (laughs) of course you have to. Right. And so they're just like, oh my God, you know, I can get this sales job. It's like a hundred thousand dollars. Wow. You know, I can put food on the table and then they get into it and it's like the burnout process starts because there is not that, like, I, if, I just feel like in talking to you, like people are going about this in the totally opposite way. Well, yeah, because I'm not ever about the money first. You can't be. When I started this, I was selling social media accounts for five bucks. You know, my average retainer was $200 a month. You don't get to go from having an average retainer $200 to average retainer 40,000 or something, unless you're truly passionate and an expert in your field. And so if you're an individual sales rep, the barrier to success is so stinking low, it should scare you. If you follow up, number one, you're ahead of at least half the reps, okay? Number two, if you can give a custom demo pitch every single solitary time that has every one of their competitors, top opportunities, and exactly how this product is and it's truly solved their pain in a creative way, you're now beating the other 25%. And the last 25% is actually knowing what the hell you're talking about. And not in like a you've heard, like you heard your boss who's really knowledgeable pitch a hundred times. So you copy all their lines. That's 95% of sales reps is they just copied other senior account executives, demo pitches and use the same lines. The problem is, is this truly good ones are using custom lines every time to the right scenario in the moment because they understand the space so well and the subject matter material. And so they can match essentially someone's needs to their budget, to their reality and they close the deal. And you can't do that unless you're an expert and, and you won't become an expert unless you're passionate. And so you've got to find those things and, you, and then you're truly successful. And you, it's hundred thousand dollars look like chump change. Once you understand passion and the bigger part of the expertise, you know, you can do really, really well. Okay. But this, it sounds like, I mean, this would take years to build up this expertise, but you were able to do it just on the sheer, you know, the self knowledge that you have and the passion for the, the su- subject and stuff like that. I mean, does this have to take years and years to become this type of sales professional? Or can, what if somebody's like 22 years old right now and they're listening to this? I'm 27. Like, yeah, right. right. So, so I mean, that be that? <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm not old, but I mean, we closed all stay right when I was 23 or 24. Like you can not do it. Years. You You can do it. You just have to live it. Like for me, it wasn't like my job. It was my life. And that's why I became better than the market. It's still a competitive marketplace. Like I'm not for working 24 hours a day or anything like that. But if you do truly want to be great at something, you know, you're going to have to put in the time, especially at first, and you're going to have to take it serious and you're going to never be able to settle with your own proposals, with your own deck, with your own product offering. You have to like treat it like it's, you know, life or death for someone to really say, okay, I trust you, especially when you don't have the age and especially when you don't have the experience. I had to prove it in my passion and my expertise and my commitment and my character and my charisma. So you just have to know what you have. Like, and you got to know who you are as a person. Like, I know I, I'm charismatic. I have a lot of people here who are very successful who aren't charismatic and they're incredibly detail-oriented. And so they win deals on their preparation. I can win deals off of my personality plus my expertise, right? But if I just had one or the other, it wouldn't work. So you have to really, it all starts with yourself. And yeah, I do think it will take you a lot of years, but if you, you're, if you don't, if, I mean, it doesn't matter how you look at it, David. If you're a rep and you're making 100000 and you're not passionate and developing your subject matter expertise in a truly real way, like actually like trying to be better than any of the engineers doing the work. Like, like the reason I'm able to sell what I sell is because I still think I'm one of the best in my whole industry at doing it. My point is if you get to that level, there is no limit for what you can make financially. You are truly limited if you're not a subject matter expert. Okay. 
And, and so God, it must be tough for sales reps to come in and sell to you because if you have, I have a feeling if you got on a demo or, or had a sales meeting and you could tell that they were just going through the motions, I don't think you would have much patience for that. Is that true? No, I, I let them know that I'm a busy, you know, I'm really busy. And I'm so sorry. I don't want to be rude. I know you've prepared a lot and I really value you. I don't think this is going to work for us. And I just let them know then so they don't have to do the whole pitch. I said, I'd love for you to focus on, you know, prospects that'll be a better fit. That's it. Yeah. And, and so you can pick it up in just, just a few moments. Like you don't two have, seconds, two, two seconds. seconds. You like, know this, this person, if that person is going to bring it or not. And the problem is, is it's usually that that person's indicative of the culture. So what that tells you is if this is the amount of preparation they're going to give you before you pay them, you're sure as hell not going to get it after you send them a check. Okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> this is a really good way to wash people out. If you've got sales calls on your calendar, right? It's like, okay, I can tell this isn't going to work. This is so interesting because I think also the the perception out there that people have of their career is like, it's a separate thing. It's like, I work at this company, I sell this product, but like, this isn't actually me. I put on a different thing when I go home and like, I do stuff that I'm passionate about. Like I, people separate that. But what I'm hearing is, your your whole this is your life like this isn't like a separated out thing and that's where you can bring that passion yeah i don't work from home you gotta hear me it's like i'm working from home i'm I'm with my wife i'm with my daughter and i'm having a blast with them but in my mind i'm constantly thinking about how do i get you know my agency to the next level i'm not really thinking about sales i'm thinking okay how do i get you know the organization to the next level what's that great opportunity what's the new growth lever how do i change this or that but if you're a rep, you got to understand, like if you're selling something and you want to go start closing deals that are 10x the size you're closing, you need to take yourself 10x more seriously. Like you can't just go out there and try to be the best with a half-ass effort. You're lying to yourself. Like if you want to be the best, you have to actually, like being a good salesperson is the easiest part. Is being the subject matter expert and the passionate person and the prepared person and the consistent person. That's what the great reps are able to do. It has nothing to do with how well they can cold call people and talk on the phone. Like that's like 1% of sales. 99% of it is your actual expertise, your passion, and your character. When you bring all those to the table, that's what allows you to close the biggest deals in the world. Got it. Okay. The, the, and, you know, it's, it's amazing because you just – you know, I think people also get stuck in that they're calling on people that have 10 or 20 years experience. And it's, it's very intimidating because it's like, they, they don't have that experience. They might just be on the job for like six months and they're talking to people that have like 10 or 20 years experience. And it's like, how, how do you, how do you get to that level quickly? And that's Well, you just have to read every day. Like the truth is right. The guy with 10 or 12 years experience, he has a different life reality than you do. Okay. He might have grandkids. He might have other stuff. He, he has different career goals than you have. He isn't trying necessarily to be the best anymore. That's just for honest truth. She, she, she might be kind of what I would like to call complacent. They're okay, satisfied, content. Those are words I'm allergic to, good or bad. And my point there is people are hiring other people, especially young men and women, for their passion, energy, and essentially awareness and ideas because they know you're living it. But if you're not living it, then why are they going to hire you if you have no experience? So you can actually re-leverage the fact that you live and breathe this to the person who frankly has the money and doesn't live and breathe it anymore. They deal with managerial issues. They deal with people issues and they deal with financial issues. They don't deal with technical issues, tactical issues, ideation issues. That's not their world anymore. So they're looking to you. And if you show up as the boring plain Jane cardboard box regurgitated ideas they, they you don't have any value prop because you don't have that experience you can't have that conversation someone else could so you have to have a different conversation and you got to understand what your strengths are perception is reality right how do they perceive you how how can you really help them and then come to the table with energy passion and excitement that they remember having back in the day and now they want to work with you because you're a spark and that's that that's the differentiator oh my god dude this is <laughs> This is amazing. This is so good. I love this. I hope everybody, you know, if we can reach like one person that listens to this, it makes such a huge difference. I'm just nodding, you know, like crazy over here because it's so true what you are saying. And and let me let me ask you this. So I wanted to talk to you also about on an organizational level, right? Because 
like there's different there's different players on the go to market side beyond just the sales rep. There's also, you know, obviously the sales development team, there's the marketing team, and they're trying to get aligned. But what I see out there a lot of times is like everybody's kind of phoning it in, man. I mean, like nobody's kind of thinking about the the company holistically and like how to move things forward. They're just like heads down on their own goals and not really communicating well and not aligning well to to the go to market, you know? And and it's just the the vibe is very like just tired, you know? Yeah, but that that's that comes from executive commitment. Okay, right. Tell me about that. So if you're in an organization where the executive isn't committed to sales and marketing alignment, they're not going to make hard decisions. They're going to let the sales guy do what the sales guy does. And, you know, oh, that's Jim. He's been here for a while now. You know, he, he always does hit his numbers. And then, well, no, that's Susan. You know, she's been on marketing. She does her thing. And, yeah, I mean, they work together. But everybody knows it's bullshit, right? But, and then the executive says that's fine. I'm telling you right now, you fired him, you fire her, you reset the tone. But people aren't necessarily willing to do that because they don't want to say no to a bird in hand. And so that's why they grow at 5% instead of 55%. And so, you know, you have to set the tone from the top down and saying marketing and sales alignment is going to be a real thing. And we are going to work together. We are going to share numbers and we are going to hit them together. You're also going to have individual numbers as a department that you need to hit. We're going to have individual departmental meetings. Don't get me wrong. We're also going to have a weekly meeting where we're talking about both and how we're getting to the same place, the same destination together and as quickly as possible. You know, that's not necessarily the case at most firms. In fact, I'd say 95% of them, it's not the case. Oh my God. I mean, so, and the thing is like the organizational structure is still set up from like 50 years ago of, you know, silos of marketing and sales and sales de- like there's these these silos that exist at most companies we have a growth team so the account executive the sdr the marketing and the so like so all of those departments they all meet together every week and we go through all our collective goals as a team and, and when we're not hitting them we ask hard questions like why didn't we hit it sales development well you know blah, 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 blah. i didn't like the leads i was getting from marketing about and, and, and you say Oh, okay. But which lead did you not like? Oh, well, all of them. Okay. But which one and where did it come from? I don't know. That's not my job, uh, but you don't like it. Well, right. <laughs> okay. So what are you going to do to fix it? Cause I'm not here to point fingers. What are you going to do to fix it? Mr. And Mrs. SDR? Cause marketing doesn't have the same contact you have with the account. So they can't fix it for you if we don't articulate why. So let's talk about why let's get on the page and let's see if we keep seeing this issue. If not, we've resolved it, right? But nobody's in the room being the grown up, saying, okay, but why? And, and making people actually articulate. It's a lot easier to be a lazy SDR and say you don't like the leads than actually go through the channel of acquisition, ask the marketing how much we spent on it, and let them know the channels you are happy with and ask if we could maybe spend more of our marketing budget in those channels because you're seeing a higher close rate and here's the revenue. Nobody's having that conversation even though they all have the data and they all have the ability to. They're not seeing it as their job. And, and that's the big problem. Right. So, so, and the, the other thing is that there's so many distractions. Like I've been in those meetings, exactly the meeting that you're talking about. And everyone's like lit, locked in on like updating Salesforce and doing Slack messages and like doing all this other shit like, in the meeting, you know? No, you're not. So like our meetings, you have no computers. It's just yeah. notes. There's okay. no, everything is a paper you need to be fully present. Yeah. If, I, if I'm going to be in the meeting, don't waste my damn time. Don't be on your phone phone, Slack, and people. I'm here to talk with you and we're going to be successful together. And, and, but see, I bring that intensity to it each time and hopefully try to hold up my end of the bargain on the leadership side to then set the tone for everyone else. But a lot of times the leaders come late. They're not prepared. They haven't read everybody's update. And, and so they react emotionally to a moment in the meeting and the meeting becomes derailed. Instead of having a strategic purpose for the meeting, that they're fully prepared for, that they can see the upcoming fires, they can navigate them appropriately. And so it's still always got to come back to the leader and say, okay, what's your role in this? And what's your responsibility? And that self-reflection and awareness is huge. So, and I, I, you know, however you want to share, but like, say you were in a situation where there was this dysfunction, you know, and you hadn't been involved for a while and you came in and you saw this meeting where people weren't talking to each other and it wasn't that you weren't digging in like you were giving me like what would be your first move as as the C- ceo 
of the company. I would schedule a dinner, <laughs> the director of both departments for that night, and I'd talk about it. And if I saw it again, and I understood the culprit as I understood the situation, coaching conversation, performance review, bye-bye. Three months tops. Done. That's yeah, nice. because you can't – how are you going to be successful – if the people that are trying to position your brand aren't talking with the people that are trying to close deals from that positioning and, and you need the two to work together or else you're going to fail. Exactly. And, and it's just like, okay, so we're on a podcast, like we're sitting here talking, like it makes such perfect sense. And, and yet I, I have to say like, just going from company to company and looking at this, this is so rare, like what well, you're actually talking about. And that's probably why directive is blowing up right now because you're actually doing this. So yeah. it's just a hard conversation. It's a hard to say. It's not easy to let Susan go or let Jim go because you like Jim. Jim's a good guy. Susan's a great woman. They've done well for you. But the truth is, if you can't make that hard decision, you're going to be stuck at 5% until you die. And then you just have to be okay with that. But don't lie to yourself and say, I want to be the biggest and the best if you don't have the gall to make the decisions you have to make to be the biggest and the best. But they're not, you know, they're not inseparable, you know? And, and so say you're, you're like that SDR that you were role playing and, and you're sitting in that meeting, like, and you're just looking around going, okay, we're not talking to each other. We're not communicating. She's on Slack. He's on Salesforce. Like what should that SDR do? I mean, they don't want to like go around their boss's back. They don't want to get in trouble, but you know, and stuff like that. Like, what would you recommend that person do if they realize that this situation is just It depends on their goals. If their goals are moved vertically, they need to say something publicly because it'll position them to get promoted. It's very easy to do that, right? So if you're an SDR and you're in that moment and you stand up and say, hey guys, can we all put our stuff away? You know, she's talking right now and I think this is important for us to focus on. You're immediately now, maybe sure you don't get to go out and drink with people. Who gives a shit? You're going to be the one who's promoted first. It's not hard. And so... You have to actually have, you know, the gall once again as the special. Like everybody thinks they have such little power and they all feel like they're victims. And the truth is, is every man and woman in a room is powerful. But they usually don't. And so you can change your reality by changing, you know, the, how you act in certain moments and standing up and communicating and preparing and being that person who's not doing that in that room, but also then proactively communicating where you hope the room is going to be as a member of the room, not even the leader of the room. You start to set the tone, and I would argue that pretty soon you're the leader of that room. Because what happens is the CEO takes those two people to dinner. One of them lets, gets let go, and guess who's going to probably be the next in line? And if not this time, the next time. And if not that time, the next time. But you never stop. And if you keep standing up and you keep aligning yourself with the executive team, you keep putting the company's interests first, you keep proactively doing those things, you are going to move vertically in the firm, and you're going to get paid more. It, it happens every time, and if they don't recognize that, Either one, you're doing it wrong and you're not aware of it. Or number two, you need to leave the firm. Got it. That consistency, playing a long game and being self-aware and knowing what's going on at the company. I love it. What, one last thing I want to ask you. Not, it's not hard to be, you've said a few times, it's not hard to be successful. It's not hard to stand out. So tell me about that. It's, 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 it's hard to be consistent. Yes. It's hard to be good in the moments. It's hard to be consistent. It's hard to be good in the moments. We can all do things that make us successful once. And then we have a tendency of overweighting that thing. You know, you get in that performance review. But remember six months ago when I did? And you're like, yeah. And what about lately? Like, what about on a consistent basis? Like, what is it that you do in your essence? And that essence of what you do as a professional, that is how people perceive you. So if you can consistently do certain things, that's when success is easy. It's, it's, the, it's the consistency part that's really hard. You know, and you have to be creative. I think the biggest thing for SDRs to be successful, this will kind of be my last little tidbit of more just tactical, is you have to succeed when you're failing. One of the biggest things we started to do at Directive, and I think it was the coolest thing we've done, is we started to map accounts. Instead of first asking for people's times, hey, do you have 15 minutes to hop on an intro call, even though I'm not sure exactly what your needs are right now, and if you're with an agency, if you're not, if blah, 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 but hey, give me 15 minutes, Right. One of the biggest things I see is we target the wrong titles and then we change our messaging. In other words, targeting the wrong titles will always fail and it manipulates all your numbers. So, and a lot of times I've found that SDRs don't actually know what every title that they're targeting truly owns internally at that organization. So they're pitching a product marketing person on lead gen and they're pitching a lead gen person on product and they're not understanding it. And then they keep changing their messaging as if the messaging was a problem. And they wonder why they got the 2% response rates and they keep split testing their messaging instead of understanding who they're talking to. 
And that's why you need to be a subject matter expert. That's one. And then number two, if you're trying to book intros, you're always going to fail. And when you fail booking an intro, you don't have any intrinsic value created from your efforts. So if you can simply map an account, do you use a product? Do you have a software for this need? Yes or no? If they say yes, great. Who are you with? When's that contract up? You'd be amazed at how easy it is to figure out if someone has a provider for what you're selling and when their contract's up. Then what you do is you map all of those, right? You try to map 10 accounts a week, 20 accounts a week. Then in a year, across a certain size team, you'll have a thousand accounts mapped. What happens to your numbers next year? Now you know when every one of those contracts is due, you run a report in Salesforce, you schedule your gift giving, you start to show up in person, and now you've cracked the biggest code in sales development, which is timing. The number one reason why sales development fails is due to a lack of timing. I've been working five years to crack that code, and this is the biggest thing I've ever come up with, is mapping accounts to solve the problem of timing. And now all your efforts as an SDR are efficient and effective. And once you understand that, you get to be a lot more effective. Oh my God, dude, that was huge. See, folks, this is why you hang around on the show. <laughs> that is, that's massive. That's so interesting because I was working with a company that there was a specific trigger point that if they knew that information and put it in, in Salesforce as a, you know, so that they could run a report, they would have way more success, but it's more of a long game and it's being consistent. Just, just like what you've been talking about. You got to think longer term than just like, Booking demo, booking demo, booking demo. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, or else you're just a victim of timing. And what the SDRs don't realize is literally the only reason they're booking the meeting is because they got the timing right, not because of anything else. Yes. Yep. Exactly. I love that. Garrett, man, this this has been gold, dude. I I learned so much. And I know that that everybody got a tremendous amount of value from being on the show. Thank you so much. I feel like we got to do round two one of these days and dig into more of this. In the meantime, if people want to get in touch with you, is it just directive.com or what's the best way to get to you? Yeah, directiveconsulting.com. You can email me at G, first initial, Marigut, last name, at directiveconsulting.com or sales at directiveconsulting.com if you'd like to hear kind of how we can help you increase lead volume and make your sales team a heck of a lot more effective. We're very good at generating leads that are closed faster in the pipeline. We're good at nurturing pipeline. And we're good at, frankly, reporting all of our marketing based on sales data, not marketing data. So you understand exactly your cost per opportunity, cost per deal, and ROI. And it's all built on a SQL database you have full access to, and it's truly innovative. So if you have a need for that, we'd love to help you. And yeah, feel free to give me a ring, follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and go from there. Yes, definitely. And dude, that sounds awesome. I want to I want to I want to get that. And if you're gonna prepare to do a sales meeting with Garrett, then go back and listen to this thing five times and get your shit together before you go in. <laughs> and Garrett, <laughs> well, thanks, thank you so much for being on the Sales Development Podcast. We'll talk again soon. Awesome. Thank you, you too. Thank you for listening to the Sales Development Podcast, the only audio forum 100% focused and dedicated to sales development with your host, David Delaney. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on YouTube and take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes. Your support makes our show possible. If you are struggling with your sales development program, contact us at 10bound.com for a no-obligation exploratory call. Again, that's 10bound.com.